Good morning, everyone. You all know me. I'm Jonathan Little. Hope you're having a fantastic Wednesday. Today is an exciting Wednesday for me. I have a um, business meeting with a mentor at um, 1 p.m. I have to write an article for Card Player Magazine. I started writing for another magazine called Luckbox. Fun name, right? It's a finance magazine. You can actually check out the article I wrote and get the first three issues for free. Um, I posted a link for that on Twitter just a second ago, at Jonathan Little. Um, also today, tonight, 6 p.m., is the Michael J. Fox Charity Foundation. Michael J. Fox Foundation Charity Tournament. There we go, it's a bit of a, time, a, bit of a tongue twister. Um, they strive to find a cure for Parkinson's disease, which is a terrible disease. Michael J. Fox has it. And um, he's been very influential in, in working towards a cure. So anyway, they're having a charity tournament tonight in New York City. There's a link to that somewhere on Twitter slash Instagram if you want to attend. Um, I'm going to be the MC. I've never been an MC for, MC for a charity poker tournament. I've been to plenty of charity poker tournaments, though, and I've seen some good MCs and some bad MCs. And I'm going to try to be a good one. Given today is an important day for me, I cut my face shaving right here. Might as well, right? You know, that's, that's how it goes. Here's part of my tongue on this coffee. Try to not do that again. Um, so, exciting Wednesday. Most time Wednesdays are kind of boring, but today is a big Wednesday. Big, big Wednesday for me. I stayed up late last night, so I'm tired as well. I was tired and excited last night. Very rarely do I have a hard time sleeping, but I um, had a little bit of coffee last night before I did my webinar where I discussed three big mistakes recreational players make. Um, you can find that video on YouTube already, uh, youtube.com slash float to turn. It should be the most recent video posted. And um, that was at 9 o'clock, but it ended up going until about 10.30. Then I had to render the video, send it to my partners. Um answer some emails. I was excited. I had to rehearse a one-minute speech I have to give tonight. And um, I was excited. It takes a lot to get me excited, but I was excited. Dean Nelson says, you have trouble when you make a deep run in tournaments and you can't sleep. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're excited, I think you will have a difficult time sleeping. It takes a lot to get me excited, though. And so I was excited. Um, let's see... Jeez, you guys are old. We have facial hair. <laughs> yes. I um, I had facial hair in sixth grade. Had a full beard. We can grow a beard, no problem. Let's see. What brand of coffee do I buy? I I don't really have a specific brand. I like Cafe Du Monde a lot because they have chicory in their coffee. If you put a, if you put put plants in the coffee, it turns out it's it's more addictive. Why is there a book, Let There Be Range, called $1,500 on Amazon? You can sell a book for whatever you want to sell it for. People buy it. Great. All right. Today, we have a good topic. It's more of a nuts and bolts topic as opposed to um, a more, uh, I like a mindset topic. Today, we're going to talk about playing against raises, against post-flop raises. Not pre-flop raises, post-flop raises. So, what do I mean by this? Let's say you raise pre-flop, big blind calls, flop comes, whatever. Big blind checks, you bet, they raise you. That's a check raise. Alternatively, you raise, they call a button, flop comes, you bet, and they raise. That's a post-flop raise. Also, they can raise the turn. They can also raise the river. So, many, many raising opportunities are available. Now, first things first. There is not a default answer to this. Don't think Oh, defended the minimum defense frequency, and then you're done. No, that will lose you a ton of money. A ton, 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 ton of money. What you need to do is you need to figure out who you're against and adjust based on their range. So, let's say we think our opponent's a nit, right? Which actually will be the case against most people. Most people, when they raise you on the flop, will be raising very, very straightforwardly, Okay. Say flop comes 9-6-3, they're check-raising king-9 or better, and no draws, <laughs> right? So if they're check-raising king-9 or better, and maybe even just like two-pair and better, uh, you need to be very, very cautious, right? 
That said, some people do view any top pair as a premium hand, right? Say they're going to view 10-9 on 9-6-3s, a hand they can check raise and just blast their whole stack in. Then a hand like 10s becomes a hand you just can't fold. But if they're only going to have like king-9 or better, they have king-9, ace-9, two pairs, and sets. And then a hand even like 10s becomes decently marginal, right? So against tight players who really are that face up and that straightforward, you should be folding a ton. You should only be continuing with your really good made hands that are getting the right price against your opponent's premium made hand range, right? And then also you should continue with your draws very often because you have big implied odds. Because if your opponent has announced that they have a very big hand, then um, that's all good, right? What else? So, um, that's what you need to do against Nits. You just need to fold a lot. Next, what about someone who plays well? Well, then that is when you need to defend at roughly the minimum defense frequency. And this is where you structure your range very intelligently. Oh, let's go back to the Nit. Sorry. Against the Nit, what should you do on the flop? Your strategy should be to bet very frequently for a small amount because you're going to be able to pick up a lot of pots very, very cheaply. You pick up lots of pots very cheaply, and when they do raise you, you can make very easy folds, right? Okay, now, uh, what about against a good player? Now we need to um, defend at the minimum defense frequency. What is the minimum defense frequency? It's 1 minus their bet divided by their bet plus the pot. So say they pot it, right? 1 minus... 50% is 50%, right? So we need to defend 50% of the time. That means of the range you bet the flop with, you need to defend with 50% of it. Now, you may have no clue what that range looks like, but it's kind of hard to defend 50% of the time unless you structure your range intelligently. So this is why you cannot continuation bet 100% of the time against good players because you just are going to have a really tough time continuing with 50% of your hands. Um, what if they check raise small? Now we need to defend like 75% of our hands, which is which is really tough if you're betting everything. So you have to bet with a more balanced range, which is going to be your best hands and your draws, which can very easily continue, and some junky draws that you can bolt. All right. Um, so against those players, you need to play a balanced strategy. And we discussed that thoroughly, 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 thoroughly over at pokercoaching.com. Um, we have homework challenges that I present every month where I teach, well, I present a question to all of the students ahead of time, a month ahead of time. They have a whole month to do the question or to, to answer the question. It usually takes three or four hours to do. It takes a while. And then I review every, I give my answer to the question. Then I review every other player's, every other student's answer in a live webinar. So I give you feedback on exactly what you're doing right and wrong. And you need to defend the minimum defense frequency against a good player. Next, what about a maniac? I don't think many people are maniacs on, uh, when they're raising, by the way. Also, it is worth mentioning, more people will raise wider on the flop than on the turn and the river. Most people in today's games, at least in my experience, will raise the flop decently well, but on the turn and river, those players, most players start to play very, very straightforwardly, which is actually why I like bluffing the turn and river a little bit more often than we should, because... Um, People fold too much, right? They presume that people are, are playing very straightforwardly. So, against a maniac, what do we do? What, what are we going to do if we know our opponent's going to check raise us on the flop every time? Well, first things first, will they re raise us if. Um, will, will they re raise us if we raise them? So, say we, they check, we bet, they raise us, we re raise, will they then jam very wide? If that's the case, we can just get it all in with middle pair, right? That said, most people aren't lunatics. Instead, they're going to check raise a lot and then fold if you re-raise. So fighting fire with fire in this situation is quite strong, right? Because they're going to fold a lot because their range is all garbage too. Um, if you know they're going to maybe just be a little bit too loose, you should instead revert to a strategy where you continuation bet with a stronger made hand range. That way you can call the raise way more often. And you can check raise these, or you can continuation bet against these people with stuff like any top pair happily. Because you know they're going to raise you a lot, and you know you can very easily call. So, that's what you want to do against those players. It really is that simple. You want to figure out who you are against 
and then adjust hard. So I see some of you are typing in questions about this. Uh, Moan says, how should you combat a player who leads from the small blind when you have an ace-x hand on 10-6-3? Should you just give up or raise the flop? Well, first off, you can call, right? Um, so let's. So leading is very different than raising. Quite often, people lead, they have some sort of marginal made hands, if they're bad. And if they're good, they have a lot of premium made hands and draws. So on 10-6-3, if your opponent is good and you have ace high, you should probably call. You don't want to raise, because if you raise, they can just jam you with their draws and their nuts and you're screwed, right? And if they call, you have no clue if you're against the draws or the nuts, so it's also not good. And the, not, uh, the draws all have plenty of equity. So in this scenario, you want to be calling to keep the pot small and bluff catch a lot against those players, because there really aren't very many premium hands on 10-6-3, right? Um, if they're bad, though, and they're leading with hands like Jack-10, right? Like you say this player had. Well, in that scenario, you should be way more inclined to just fold because they're leading with hands like Jack-10, not planning to fold. Now, some people will lead with stuff like middle pair or bottom pair, and those players will fold if you raise them. So against those players, you should raise with everything besides your best hands. Because with your best hands, you really want to keep them in. With, your, their, with, their, with your garbage hands and your draws, etc., you want to get them to fold, right? Yeah, if anyone's trolling on any of the random sites, ban them. Ban hammer is heavy over here. All right. Thank you for these live feeds. Well, thank you for being here. Plaza says, you tend to have a hard time dealing with turn raises after you continuation bet flop and turn. You find you fold way too often. Well, first off, Plaza, it's probably fine to fold too often, right? Because, like I said, a lot of people are not check raising or raising the turn very often. Now, if you see them doing it frequently, right? Some people will do this frequently. If you see them doing, frequent, doing it frequently, you do need to start defending very wide. And so what you can do is you can not bet the turn as often. I mean, think about it, right? We discussed this at PokerCoaching.com. You're there. You know this. The hands you want to bet the flop and the turn with are usually going to be very, very premium made hands, which you're not folding. You're not folding two pair, right? You're not folding aces. And then also draws. And your draws, you know, your bad ones you'll fold and your good ones you're, you'll be getting the right price. That said, you know, Plaza, if you're playing against very straightforward players, you should be continuation betting the flop in the turn with top pair, like all top pairs, all middle pair, good kickers, etc. And then folding if you get raised because you're exploiting them, right? You're exploiting the fact that they don't raise you very often. Brad says, thanks for the webinar last night. Good job. No, well, thank you. If um, any of you missed it, you can find that on YouTube. It's already up. The replay's already there. YouTube.com slash float the turn. It's the most recent video. We discussed the three three big leaks of recreational players, where I reviewed three hands that um, a guy named Nickel sent me. Nickel was a winner of one of the $25,000 buy-in um, Poker Stars tournament seats in January. He won it by losing a lot of weight, getting in shape, stopping sm stop smoking cigarettes, and getting his diabetes under control. Uh, Jamie Staples awarded a seat to the person who had the biggest change, and it was him. And I was moved by a story, decided to coach him for free if I could share the coaching videos with all of you later. He said, sure. And there it is. We made um, 15, no, how many hours? Six hours of content where I reviewed 15 of his hand histories. And the first hand history I reviewed with him, he was awful, awful, awful. And within like 40 minutes, I found like three gigantic errors. I shared those in the webinar. And that was just in the first 40 hands I saw, right? And I went through thousands of hands. Um, but by the end of it, what we did is I would review a hand history, send it to him. He would get back to his questions, clarifications, etc. Then I would review another hand history, a, a new one. So we had a lot of back and forth over the course of two or three months. And by the end of that, he was actually very, very good. And like last night, he took sixth place in, a, in an online tournament. I know he won another tournament in the process of our coaching. And this is a guy who was, who was literally not very good initially. So I'm excited to, I'm excited to see that he's, he's improving significantly. Galfon says one of the best ways to exploit your opponents is, is to fold. Well, yes, of course. Well, that's what I just said, Mark, right? If, if your opponents are going to be only raising with the best hands, then you should be folding a lot. Now, Kevin says folding is only a small mistake. That's not necessarily true. Um, if your opponent's bluffing too much, folding is a disaster. Like, it's a, it's a horrendous disaster. Also, if your opponent's bet small and you fold, folding's a horrendous disaster. If your opponent's, like, jamming it all in and you're getting very poor pot odds, then yeah, well, folding's like not that big of a deal. But if your opponents are betting third pot or 20% pot, and you're drastically over folding, like let's say I continuation bet 100% of the time for 20% pot, and you only continue with 60% of your range, you are going to get crushed. 
Like, you just can't win. You cannot win a poker if you do that. So, in that scenario, folding is a detrimental mistake. And even then, I mean, that's, you're still calling 60% of the time, or 40% of the time, or whatever. All right, let's see. We had some questions on Instagram. Do you ever format in position? Wait, do you ever format in position when your head's up in a pot if you believe your opponent is weak and three bet bluffed? Yeah, sure. Usually with a balanced range. If I pick music tonight, an MC is not the DJ. Those are different jobs. Um, you play a couple of hyper aggressive people from Greece. They apply a ton of pressure, but often release when they get pressure back. Yeah. Because it's rare, you're playing a stack this yeah, against them. Yeah, so that's what I was saying earlier. If your opponents actually are relatively aggressive, you can re-raise them a lot, and they'll fold if they're competent at all, right? You're forced to make a decision for your stack. So you just take on the variance and shove them without the nuts. Uh, yeah, you don't need only the nuts. If you only get your money in with the nuts, you will get demolished. What can you do against playing against a maniac if you're card dead? Sit there and fold a lot. Fortunately, in poker, you don't really have to play all that many hands, right? Especially if you're playing a cash game, you just sit there and fold and fold and fold forever. It costs you literally nothing. In a tournament, you know, um, you do need to get some hands eventually. And if you don't get hands at all, let's say you literally do get 9-3 every hand. Yeah, you're going to lose. What are you going to I mean? That's it. I actually have a video available in the rewards section of PokerCoaching.com called How to Thrive When Card Dead, where I discuss exactly what to do and how to at least have a shot to do well when you are card dead. Uh, funny enough, Nickel, the guy who played the $25,000 mine tournament, he was card dead. And funny enough, it's funny that he said he was card dead because when I first started coaching him, he played like 40% of hands. <laughs> he was in there. Every ASEX he played. Um, but uh, during the main event, he said he was card dead on the first day, still picked his spots well, chipped up in appropriate spots, and he made day two with about two starting sacks, which is fantastic. Then after a while, hung out again, didn't get many cards, got on with a flip and lost. If he won that, though, he would have been in great shape to get in the money. Is it possible to do well without ever getting to a showdown? I mean, sure, in theory, you could just win every small pot, right? So funny enough, there's the, always the um, hypothetical question of what if you got a hand like queens every hand, could you win a tournament? The answer is obviously yes, you just never play a big pot. You win every medium-sized pot. All right, if, aside from all variables that go into a tournament and cash games, can you use the same ranges? Um, depending on stack size, if you're discussing the same stack size, roughly you can. Obviously, there are payout implications and whatnot that should change things, but the ranges really should not change that much as long as you are adjusting based on stack size. A lot of people never adjust, though, which is why they get crushed. That's almost, well, that is the premise of my first book. The fact that most people don't adjust based on stack size. And because of that, they lose. Your local games are soft and you're developing bad habits. Well, Mark, understand, your goal is to beat your opponents, not to learn to beat everyone in the exact same manner, right? Someone asked me last night, if they play local bar games, is that bad for them to develop as a poker player? And the answer is no, as long as you realize these bad players are bad players and you are exploiting them hard. Because when you go to the World Series of Poker, there are going to be bad players. And to be fair, people who play bar poker games all the time probably know how to play against them way better than I do. Because they have experience, right? And I, I don't really. And um, as long as they understand that, that those skills to beat those players are very different than the skills required to beat very good players or tight players or whatever, then they'll, they'll be fine. Noobs always think there's a default strategy. <laughs> yeah, there is no default strategy. Let's see. You were against a drunk maniac. Three other players called as drunk bets, so you folded top pair. Mm, I, I don't fold a whole lot of top pairs. Is 10,000 hands, no, is 10, hands enough to know you're good at a certain stake? Uh, no. 10,000 hands is about two days of online poker. You can easily go on a two-day downswing in online poker. I prefer cash or tournaments. I don't really care. I'm pretty easy when it comes to things like that. I think both games are fine. I'm not particularly picky in life or poker. If the game is good, I play the game. If the game is not good, I do not play the game. It's not like, oh, I only play tournaments because I need the thrill of winning first place. I mean, like, I don't care about that at all. I want to go there and I want to win the most equity possible. And very often, a soft cash game is way better than a tournament. 
But a tournament is way better than most cash games at high stakes, at least. If you're a small stakes player, though, cash games are the way to go because then you get to grind up your bankroll slowly with relatively little variance. Tournaments has huge variance, and also you're almost always down because you lose, 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 and you win. Lose, 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 win, right? And it takes a very strong mindset to deal with quote unquote, being down almost all the time. What about live? 10,000 hands is like six months of play. Listen, you have to understand that the venue is irrelevant. What is relevant, though, is your win rate over your sample. If you play 10,000 hands of live poker and you're winning at 10 big blinds per hour, you're probably somewhere between, I don't know, 4 big blind per hour winner and 15 big blind per hour winner, right? As you play more and more, you can more accurately predict your win rate. Funny enough, though, in live cash games, it's kind of silly to say you make X amount per hour because at some tables you will make a ton per hour and at some tables you will make way less per hour. Is 5-5 five five considered a small stakes game? The idea of small stakes, medium stakes, big stakes is all asinine in theory because really it's uh, more a question of what is the composition of the players at the table. If your opponents are all very bad and they're playing $500, $1,000 blinds, well, it's like a tiny stakes game, right? Um, they have this uh, show on Poker Go on Fridays, I think, where they play like 5-10 or 5-10-20 and everybody's just like all in blind every hand. And that's the softest game in the world, but they're playing for thousands of dollars, right? So, really, it's more of a question of the composition of players. If you're playing a 5-5 game that is super tough, because it's the biggest game in the room, and there's only one table, and there's a bunch of 1-2 tables, and everybody at 5-5 is really, really good, well, then it's like a high-stakes game, right? If 5-5 is the smallest game in the room, and everyone's drunk, then it's, it's a super soft game. Again, stop trying to put things in very specific buckets. It's not really, or not, not very vague buckets, like small stakes, medium stakes, big stakes. Jasper says, what's a good VPIP? I don't know. Depends on the situation, right? Depends on your opponents. Especially in live tournaments, it really depends on your opponents. What stakes online do you feel like the competition really starts? I don't know what that even means. I started with $50 online and grinded it up. Uh, Maniac sits down with sits down and raises ten to twelve big blinds, five hands in a row. What are our adjustments? Seems like they only play. Seems like you only play tens plus an ace queen. Is that too nitty? Yes, that is too nitty. You likely need to be jamming, especially if you're playing a cash game where you have hundred big blinds or less. When they make it ten big blinds, it's jam super wide. Jam super super wide. I seem to have a solid mindset and very little bother to. That's true. Is there anything that would push you over the edge and cause you to tilt, or am I above that? I mean. Like, losing poker hands is not a problem because you lose poker hands, you get used to it. Also, I've lost plenty of poker hands, and I've won plenty of poker hands, and you just stop caring. It just doesn't matter. You realize it doesn't matter eventually. Problem is, most people don't play that many hands ever, and they also don't play that many hands in such a condensed period of time. I mean, like I said, if you're sitting and playing live online cash games, you're playing 5,000 hands a day, and you're swinging 20 buy-ins a day, it just doesn't matter, right? And, and you see your, your win rate graph slowly trickling up, even though your swings are all over the place like this, you realize the swings are irrelevant. Um, I mean, like, and also another idea of tilt is that whenever you tilt, you revert back to your baseline knowledge. Fortunately for me, my baseline knowledge is quite high. Every once in a while, I'll be playing a fun, fun, casual poker game, and we'll have a bunch of drinks in us. And I still play quite well. And that's because my baseline knowledge is of a player who's trying to win, right? I'm not going to revert to just a total fish because I don't have that fish mindset, right? I'm not going to start playing 9-2 offsuit for fun. And also, I know how to play pretty well, right? I mean, that's really what it amounts to. It's not like I don't understand the game. So even if I do happen to, quote, unquote, go on tilt, it would still be better than almost everyone else who's playing normally because we study a lot, right? What stakes does poker get harder? It gets always gets harder as you move up. Every stake gets harder. How many, is, how many hours of live is a big enough sample to analyze your win rate? I don't know. It depends on how accurate you want to be, right? Like I said earlier, if you play six months, you'll have a decent idea. If you play 10 years, you'll have a really good idea. Do we tighten up ranges as we approach the final table? No. Depends on your stack, right? If you're the big stack, you want to be likely running people over. If you're middle stack, you probably want to tighten up. If you're shallow stack, you probably want to be getting in there and gambling and trying to get a chip, a chip stack. 
You're going to Vegas to play a bunch of tournaments. Any advice? Write a lot of notes. Go to johnfalonepoker.com slash notes. Do that. Um, actively think. Don't go out and get wasted. Um, be mindful at the table, right? Just make good use of your time. What do you think about double and triple up sit and goes for building a bankroll? Horrible idea. Don't waste your time doing that. The games do not exist above the tiniest stakes because the game is very easy. Games like satellites, games like double or nothing sit and goes, these games require very, very basic strategies to beat. Now, of course, if you're playing against all terrible players, then you'll have a nice win rate. The problem, though, is that if you're winning a lot, a lot of money in a $5 game, it's just not a big deal, right? Um, this is the reason why almost the, the online satellites are barely beatable because at the high stakes because everyone knows the strategy, and the strategy is very easy. Same thing for sit and goes, right? I used to be very good at sit and goes, but the, the biggest ROI you could have was like 5%. And as people got better, that 5% ROI trickled down to zero to where no one wins, and then trickles down a little bit more to where everyone's losing the rake. Then people rely on rake back, and um, sometimes sites take that away from you. <laughs> um, so the game's very simple, right? You don't really want to spend your time learning a very simple game because games that are very simple typically, typically do not have much of a future, which is why Sit and Ghost died. It's why Satellites Online are nearly unbeatable. That's why Double or Nothing Sitting Goes. I used to play them for high stakes, but they died very quickly because there's no skill, right? It's all luck at, it's all luck at that point. It's all luck whenever everyone plays optimally, right? Let's say we play 5 cent, 10 cent with $100 buy-ins. You double it and a bunch of hands. Should you start taking stabs at 10 cent, 25 cent? Yeah, sure. So you'll have $200 then? Uh, no, you probably need to be a little bit more cautious. Listen, all these bankroll questions, I already answered these. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Would you rather play deeper or shallower against good, aggressive players? Listen, if your opponents are better than you, you want to be playing as shallow as you can. If, they're, if you're better than them, you want to be playing as deep as you can, assuming they're not on your left. If they're on your left, or you're on their left, um, chips flow to the left and no limit hold them, and all games with a button. So chips flow to the left, which means that you want the shallow stacks on your left and the deep stacks on your right. Because you're going to win pots from the guy on your right and you're going to lose pots to the guy on your left. So to go to a cash game, don't just think, oh, I buy in for 100 big blinds. That's what I do. No, that is a fishy mindset. You instead need to think, when I buy in, if the players on my left are very shallow, that's great. And I can buy in for any amount I want because the people on my right, if they're deep, I'm going to be winning pots from them. But if you sit down and there's a bad player on your right, so you have a decent seat, but on your left with 100 big blinds, but there's a good player on your left with 500 big blinds, you'd be an absolute fish to buy in for 500 big blinds because you're going to lose 500 big blind pots to the guy on your left. You're going to lose all your money. What did I study in college? Engineering and psychology, but I quit all that to study poker. What do I think about people who try to table talk other people into tilting? I think that they're fish. Um, can we explain EV? Basically, say we got a coin, we flip the coin, we're 50-50, right? Whenever we flip the coin, say we both bet $100 on it, one of us is going to win 100 one of us is going to lose 100 but no one lost any EV. Because, on average, if you do it a million times, it's going to be even, right? Roughly even. If you do it infinite times, it will be even. The equities are the same. Let's say instead, um, I pay you $200 when you win, but you only pay me $100 when I win. Well, that's now really bad for me, right? you're now in a very profitable spot because half the time you're going to win 200 and half the time you're going to lose 100. So 0.5 times 200 is 100. 0.5 times minus 100 is 50, is 50. So you win, what, 100 minus 50. You win $50 every flip in that scenario. So that is very plus EV for you and very minus EV for me because I lose $100 every flip. Oh, let's see, our satellites all luck. Every game is all luck if everyone has an equal skill set. And as games get easier and easier to learn, skill sets become equal faster. So um, the only reason satellites even exist for the most part, well, first off, everyone likes to parlay, right? Satellites are great because they attract very recreational players who are trying to get rich quick, right? So there are always some bad players in the field. Um, also, like online, people satellite from a $5 game into a, 
a hundred dollar game into a hundred dollar game into a 500 from a 500 into a 10k right so you end up with some five dollar buying players playing five hundred dollar buying tournaments so that's the reason satellites online have you have like any chance to have a win rate but if you look at the very best players well even like the top 100 players they're just going to demolish the very bad players the thing is though is that um there aren't very many very bad players who trickle their way up to the top but i mean like look at sit and goes right i had to stop playing sit and goes because everyone's roi I went to zero because the game is too easy if you're playing an easy game then you should not expect to have a high win rate it just is what it is so i had to move to tournaments right tournaments are way more difficult cash games are way more difficult because you're playing deeper stacks and there's more skill involved well, I say more skill. There's, it's a different skill set, and it's a bigger skill set. So maybe that doesn't mean it's more skillful. I think a lot of people in satellites just don't understand the fact that there's a funny payoff structure, right? When there's a funny payoff structure, you should um, adjust to it, right? Like, for example, say you have, well, aces on the bubble. Say you're on the bubble of satellites, someone goes all in, and someone calls you're guaranteed a seat if you just fold, assuming they both have the same stacks, right? So obviously you don't call, duh. If you're that bad that you don't understand you're supposed to fold there, yes, you're clearly gonna lose. But anyone who can look at a structure and think, anyone who can look at aces and think, okay, aces here are an easy fold because I'm guaranteed a free seat, you're gonna have no problem in satellites. It's just not a hard game. I have a chapter by Bernard Lee, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. It basically outlines exactly what you need to do. You need to kind of play normally, get some chips, double up or so, triple up or so, and then start knitting it up. Play lots and lots of small pots, try to not be all in. In the cash game, what percentage of winning should determine when you leave the table? Uh, none. Go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll. You should quit when the game is bad or you don't want to play. It should not matter if you're up or down. To be fair, in general, you should be quitting when you're down, because when you're down, on average, the game is going to be tougher. Is playing a 1K satellite for the World Series a bad idea if they can't afford to play a 10K? Listen, go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll. Do whatever you want with your money. I'm not going to tell you not to gamble. If you want to gamble, go gamble. What does bad mean, right? Irresponsible? I don't know. Do whatever you want. If you outline specifically your situation, I will give you advice on it. But there's nothing wrong with gambling. You have to understand, almost everyone who plays poker plays poker because they like to gamble and they're trying to get rich quick. And if that's you, then satellites are a great way to do it. They're a great way to gamble and a great way to get rich quick. Horrible way to grow a bankroll. Horrible way to practice sound bankroll management. Horrible way to survive long term. But great to gamble, great to get an experience. And um, that's what a lot of people are playing for, right? You're a believer that if you put in time studying, you get back what you put in. Well, sometimes. Um, if you put in more hours, wait, the more hours you put in, the easier it becomes. Yes. Also, no ego problems. Good. You find you have a hard time reading people when they play weird online. Hold a manager helps. Yes, hold a manager is very useful. Live satellites, on the other hand, offer a really good chance to take a shot in tournaments you can't afford. Right, exactly, Christian. You are gambling and you're trying to get rich quick. Nothing wrong with that. What do you recommend when your bankroll is only two buy-ins? Yeah, exactly. Don't play. Move down uh, 10, 20 times as much, 20 times smaller than you're playing. You recently took down your first tournament. Good job. You have a small bankroll. How should you go about finding the right stakes? Go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll. Can you explain why 10-7 suit would be plus EV under the gun 6 max? It, it is not plus EV under the gun 6 max. What about sit and goes make them easy? It's a shallow stack to game, right? First off, there's a very clearly defined payoff structure, um, which is easy to learn. Also, whenever you get to the late stages, the stacks are usually, well, they must be very, um, there aren't very many situations that come up, right? In tournaments, there are all sorts of situations that can come up. Because they're uh, different payoff structures, different number of people get paid, um, stacks will vary more. But as it goes, only 10 buy-ins on the table. And if there are four people left and three get paid, well, like at the most, one guy's gonna have like 60%, everybody else is gonna have some change and then they're going to be in the middle. So there aren't that many situations you actually have to learn. Same thing for satellites. Same payout structure every time. Um, often stacks are not all that gigantic. And usually what happens in a satellite is that towards the end, there are a lot of short stacks. So the situation isn't already that different, right? What's the best way to prepare for a tournament? Study at pokercoaching.com.
So I play mostly live or online. Live now, because I live in America. How much do live tells play into your game? A lot at tiny stakes, almost none at high stakes. All right, what's my favorite live tell? I, I found a lot of people, especially in small states, they just kind of like get in the zone whenever, whenever they're, they're playing. They're like, oh yes, I have a good hand. And then they go, what is EV? I already answered that. You'll have to go back and watch it later if you missed it. Am I saying satellites are not good because it's an easy game? Listen, Mike, I'm saying satellites are not good because, well, what does good mean? Again, Mike, if you're trying to get rich quick, satellites are fantastic. When you play a satellite, what are you doing? Anytime you play any game, you always want to ask, what am I signing up for? Okay? When you're playing a cash game, you're going to win or lose one or two or three or four buy-ins almost every time. Small swings, right? Small swings are great if you have an edge. Mike says a satellite is to qualify for a bigger game. No, Mike. Absolutely incorrect. A satellite is to take a small amount of money to play a bigger tournament to then try to win a bigger amount of money. So what are the odds? You always want to break it down to a math problem. What are you trying? What are the odds you cash in the satellite? Let's say you're really good at satellites. Really, really good. You're like the best. So, so you're going to cash one in eight times. Okay? When one in ten are supposed to cash. So you have a nice edge. How often do you cash in the main event that you satellite into? Well, you're one in eight to cash that if you're break even. Most satellite players are awful at regular tournaments because they don't have a lot of experience. They're satellite regulars and they know how to play only one structure that's easy. So, of course, not all satellite players are, are like that. I know like many of the great super high roller players are um, sit and go players or satellite players. I mean, I started with, with sit and goes, right? And I played a ton of satellites. And back in the day, when people didn't know how to play, you just print the money. But now everyone's good, so you don't print the money anymore. Anyway, let's say you're one in eight to cash the main events. That means you're going to cash, get some money back, one in 64 times. And even then, you only get a min cash almost all the time. Right? So we're now we're 1 in 64 to get any money back. Now, I already told you that whenever you're playing tournaments, your bankroll is going to trickle down, trickle down, trickle down, and then spike whenever you hit a, a big score, like a 100 buy-in score. When you play satellites, it's going to go down, 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 down. And then, every once in a while, you get a little bump for like 20 big lines, or 20 buy-ins. So you lose 64, win 20. Lose 64, win 20. Lose 64, win 20. And every once in a while, you spike for like 500 or 1,000. And that's like the worst thing you could possibly do for bankroll management because you're, you never get paid. You almost never have a big score. Now, of course, someone does, but um, probably isn't going to be you because you're not going to be the one who puts in 10,000 satellites, right? No one plays 10,000 satellites. Most people play a small amount. Now, it's very different if you're playing the satellite with the idea of I'm going to play the main event anyway. Because if you're going to play the main event anyway, because you're probably bankrolled, then sure, play the satellites. It's just like a cash tournament, right? Like I play plenty of satellites because they're like a cash tournament. Uh, day before main event, very often they have a satellite that's one in five qualify or one in ten qualify. And those are often super soft because all the gamblers are trying to get in there. But I know I'm playing the main event anyway, so it's just a, it's a tournament for cash with an easy structure. Um, sometimes it does make sense to play... A satellite, if the main event is like almost within your reach. Another big problem with satellites, by the way, is that when you satellite in, say you normally play $500 tournaments, so you satellite into a 5K, okay? Now you're playing a tournament 10 times the size that you're used to against players who are way better than you at a structure that you don't quite understand. Is that really what you want to be doing? What really happens to satellite players, if they're very good, is they cash... One and eight times in satellites, so they have an edge. But then they cash in the, in the tournament, I don't know, 10% of the time, and then they just literally never win it. And that's it. What's the best way to improve at tournaments? Dimani says he's going to say to sign up for PokerCoaching.com. Yes, go to PokerCoaching.com and sign up. It's completely free to get a trial membership. There's a ton of information on this page. Thank you, Thomas. I do a lot of work. I've only been here doing this for 15 years. <laughs> Armando says some charts um, say 10 to 7 suited is plus EV. So I'm sure you could justify raising 10 to 7 suited some tiny portion of the time from under the gun plus 1 6 handed. Like it's not bad. 
And the reason it's not bad is because these low suited connected hands do quite well, especially if your opponents are going to be calling you with hands that don't dominate you, right? Like if you raise and cutoff has king 10 offsuit, they should just fold, right? So you're not getting called by hands that dominate you. So you're going to be very live. And also your opponent's not going to put you on so many hands like that. Quite often you're raising the lower suited connected stuff just to um, give you better board coverage so that you have the nuts sometimes on various middle and low card flops. It lets you continuation bet more and defend better. But also completely not necessary. If I played cards like I answered questions, we would crush. We could crush. Wait, we could crush him. I don't know if you're trolling me or what. How frequently do you need to play to consider a win rate valid? Well, win rates degrade over time, right? Because everybody gets better over time. In all games, people get better over time because people learn, right? As people learn, everyone's win rate goes down. This is why you see athletes, right? World records get broke every year. How do world records keep getting broken? People aren't getting stronger. People are learning better techniques. Maybe people are getting a little bit stronger. I don't know. Well, people are learning better techniques to allow themselves to get stronger. And games always get tougher. So your win rate should go down over time. And if your game is easy, like sit and goes, like satellites, you should see that number degrade to zero. And that's fine. Like, look at tic-tac-toe, right? Tic-tac-toe is a very easy game. All of you know how to play it perfectly. And if you don't, you can learn it in like five minutes. So no one plays tic-tac-toe for money because it would be stupid because there's no edge, right? You're straight flipping. And you're not even flipping. It's always a tie. So... That's it. Did anyone win the Mid-States Poker Tour seat? Yes, they did. Um, we will be announcing the name soon. We we're trying to get his Twitter name, but he's being slow getting it to us. But yes, someone won. If it's not you, well, sorry. <laughs> Mark says, many of you work for a living, so satellites are attractive because they give you a shot to play an event you could not afford otherwise. Mark, why do you want to play an event you can't afford otherwise? You don't consider bankroll issues the same way I do. Yeah, I mean, exactly, Mark. You are straight up gambling with that mindset. And there's nothing wrong with gambling. Again, please don't think I'm saying you should not be gambling. If you want to go and you want to play blackjack or craps or whatever, do it. It doesn't matter. Kate K App says the email, or check your email, the winner has been announced. Good, thank you. Thought we mailed it, but maybe we didn't. You never know. Anyway, Mark, um, a lot of people, they want to get rich quick, right? They want to play big. Also, you know, one thing I think is really dumb about people's mindsets, why do they want to satellite into a 3,500 or a 5K or a 10K? Why don't they satellite into a 100K or the million dollar tournament? Why do they stop? I, I, I don't get that, right? If you're trying to win infinites, why do you stop at only a 3,500? Because if you win a 3,500, you're not going to win life-changing money. You're going to get like 500K or something, which is a lot. Don't get me wrong. But it's certainly not life-changing. So if you are really trying to spin it up, you need to be satelliting into 100Ks, where if you win, you get millions, right? So if you're really trying to gamble, really trying to get excited, really trying to play against the best players in the world, really trying to get your money in poorly, <laughs> satellite into 100Ks. Christian said it helps your mindset to know that you satellite into a 500 up front. Let's not talk about the problem of... When you play satellites, you're playing a game that um, you're very often not using your time wisely, right? Like, let's say you could play a 2-5 no limit game and win at a rate of 40 bucks an hour. If you play eight hours of a satellite, you could have won, what, $320. Is that right? Maybe that's right. I don't know. You're going to win a lot of money, right? 3 or 20 bucks on average. Whereas instead, if you're donking around playing $100 and $300 uh, satellites, if your ROI is like 100%, if you're just like killing it, which you're not, you're going to make $100 in those many hours. So it's just not a good use of time. That's the other issue. Always think in terms of return on investment. Everyone who's sitting here saying, I, like, I have these mindset problems, you're not thinking in terms of return on investment. Whenever you sit and you play, you make some return on investments. Okay? So what happens is when you buy into a $100 tournament, you make 20% ROI. You make $20 in four hours. It's five bucks an hour. Not a good deal. You're playing scared if you satellite into a big buy-in tournament. Some people do, some people don't. But yes, they typically do play scared. 
you always hear all the pros, and uh, pro tip for everyone out there, if you're a pro and you're going to go play a tournament, always buy in when the satellite ends, because that's when all the satellite people end, and you get registered in the same tables that they do, so your table will be slightly softer than normal. So don't buy in the day of the tournament. That's fishy. Buy in when the satellite players buy in. Um, LOL, 500K not being life-changing money. Yeah, so listen. 500K will change your life, but that's like the best result when you're trying to spin it up, and you almost never get that, right? That's the thing. Whereas if you satellite into 100K, all you have to do is cash for the minimum. You cash on that a lot. So sure, it's going to be harder to get into the main event, but once you get in there, you're like really live to cash, Whereas to get a good cash. Whereas if you're getting into a 3,500, usually you're going to cash for like 7K and you're going to spend it on bills or something. It's just gone. What's a good win rate? 10 big blinds per hour is pretty solid. Did I ever read that book on poker mindset? I have read almost every poker book. I don't recall the one you're referring to. I like the one by Jared Tendler. And I wrote a book on mindset with Dr. Trisha Cardner. People forget this is a skill game. You rarely hear a person say they can compete at the PGA Tour, but everybody thinks they can beat poker pros. That's what makes it so profitable. Indeed, indeed. That is true. If you told me I had um, 10 satellites a year to try to get rich quick, I would definitely not be trying to splay tiny six satellites and satellite into a 3,500. I'd be trying to spend my money up hard. Because that's really gambling, right? Whenever you make a parlay card in Sportsbook, you don't bet on one, you don't bet on a two-leg parlay. That's not fun. You bet on a 10-leg parlay. Why don't people do that with poker? Sports bettors do it all the time. Of course, it's still ridiculous. And they big, big the hell out of you for a parlay card, for, which doesn't make any sense. But um, I think everyone should be trying to spend it up harder, honestly. Because wouldn't it be sweet to have someone who got into 100K for a dollar and then won the 100K? It will happen if, if, you know, 500 million people play. Eventually it'll happen. So I don't know why people only try to aspire to get into the main events. Like why, why the five, 3Ks and the 5Ks? I don't think anyone has ever explained this to me. Um... What's the best cash game to learn? No Limit Hold'em, for sure, by a mile. Do I prefer to register at the beginning? Yes, you wanna play at the beginning because on average more bad players are in the turn at the beginning. The Shadow, go to jonathanlepoker.com slash bankroll. I wrote a, like a 20 page article for all of you. Kevin says he wants the millionaire maker. Right, exactly. Why? Why that 1500 Why not try to get in the main events? Really spin it up. Really spin it up. Go for it. Gamble hard, right? That's what we're trying to do. Gamble hard. I get the vibe that everyone, everyone thinks they want to gamble, but at the end of the day, they don't. Like so many people at the end of the millionaire maker, when they're actually playing for the millions, they finally got to do it. They're like, oh, can we make a deal? Can we make a deal? Because I don't want to gamble anymore. I mean, you see this all the time, right? People go and they buy into a $60 tournament and... At the end, they want to chop when they're playing for a difference of like 300 bucks. Like, oh, let's make a, let's make a chop. And like, no, that's when you need to be gambling the most. Are we doing morning coffee during the World Series? Um, probably, but I don't know for sure. Why no limit hold'em instead of other games? Because other games, first off, there's no guarantee of a future for the other games. It's way more likely that no limit hold'em survives in the other games. Also... PLO, for example, it has tons and tons and tons of variants, right? You don't want variants if you're trying to grind it up. Um, you could play a game like Seven Card Stud, but that, those games are very close to dead now, so you don't really want a game that's obviously in the process of dying. So the only game that makes logical sense is a game that has a decent skill edge that is clearly not dying, at least at a fat, fast rate. So No, no Limit Hold'em is the only, only game that makes sense. So you shouldn't try to make chops? No, you shouldn't try to make chops. I made a video about this on YouTube. Let's not make a deal or something like that. Go find it on my YouTube channel. I just posted it, I don't know, a week ago. Have I heard of this poker variant D's Nuts? No. And, and listen, I mean, I understand that lots of people like to play games. At the end of the day, I, if you want to get good at poker and you want to win significant money consistently, get very good at one form of poker. Is Zoom poker profitable? If you're very, very good, Listen, every form of, almost every game can be profitable if you're, like, the best in the world. But most people aren't the best in the world. They think, 
Is it profitable? Can I go play it tomorrow and win? Like, no, of course you can't go play it tomorrow and win. Don't be an egomaniac and think that you're a genius just because you won three poker sessions in a row or something. Will we have a breakfast in the World Series? I will. Um, while in the beginning, I will not. I don't think. The problem at the beginning of the series is that World Poker Tour 10K, World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions, and the 5K is going on. You know what? Maybe I could do it. Maybe I could do it the morning of the 5K. That might make sense. I could, I could maybe do that. Mark, send me. Who asked me that? Was that Mark? Yeah, Mark, send me, send me the schedule of when the 5K and the 500 are happening, and um, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Micro cash or tournaments to build a bankroll. Again, Sean, do you want variance or no? There you go. That's the answer to your question. Hasn't it been mentioned that factors to consider for moving up are win rate and, of course, bankroll? Win rate, standard deviation, risk of ruin, perceived edge at the higher stake, it should go down, etc., etc. Go read the article, please. Stop asking the same question. Why does Zoom seem harder? Because people are better at Zoom. Why are people better at Zoom? Why are people better at online than live? It's the same answer. Online players are a million times better than live players because they play many, many, many more hands. Okay? They get better faster. The winners and losers get separated quicker. What does Zoom do? Same thing. They play many, many more hands. And they play them much faster. So the winners, again, get separated much quicker than regular online poker. So Zoom is fantastic if you are a winner. But it's already been proven that not many people are winning at like 2-5 Zoom. Whereas people are winning at 25, 50, no limit, right? So figure that out. All right, I'm going to go now. If you're in New York City, Michael J. Fox charity tournaments tonight, I'm going to be the MC. Hopefully I didn't blow up my voice doing this. I have to go make videos now, so I may not be able to talk by tonight. Um, there's a link to sign up. Don't just show up. There's a link you have to sign up at on Twitter and Instagram. My, my Twitter and Instagram, J. Cardshark on Instagram, Jonathan Little on Twitter should be a lot of fun. I'm marginally nervous. Not really nervous. I'm more excited. Nervous and excited. I really don't get nervous or excited very much, so I like the feeling. All right. That's it for today. Good luck. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Happy Wednesday. I'll see you on Friday.